and all her stuff was there. She was just gone. People are just saying, well, just go search the mountain. Well, it's not an easy thing to do. This is a needle in a haystack, to say the least. What could have kept these devoted young parents from coming home? My name is Brittany Davis, and I am Tyler Davis's wife. He has been missing since February 24th of 2019. We met in 2013. We were friends for a long time before we got together. Tyler is really funny. He's very sarcastic, has a good sense of humor. He was a business manager. His work ethic is something I've strived for, that's for sure. It doesn't take long for the happy couple to settle down and start a family. He wanted a boy bad. I've never seen a father and a son relationship like Tyler has with our son. I've always been very lucky to be blessed with such a good husband in my life that takes such good care of both of us. It's um, something I've always been really grateful for. On February 23rd, 2019, the Davises dropped their one-year-old off with Tyler's parents on their way out of town. It was my birthday, we had plans. We were gonna go do something. We honestly didn't even have a place or a hotel even booked until the day before we left. We live in Wilmington, which is about an hour away from Columbus. We had just planned on meeting some friends up in the area. Um, Tyler has a couple friends in Columbus and so do I. We had a couple's massage planned for the next day. We were just excited to get to spend some time together without a one-year-old strapped to us. That night, Brittany and Tyler meet up with their friend Sean at the hotel in Columbus, Ohio. We hung out in our hotel for a little while, and then from there we had went to the first bar, which was probably around 8.30 or 9. We were there for a few hours, and then we had took a ride share to a club a little bit farther away. Everybody was having a good time, you know, we're laughing, joking amongst the three of us. It didn't seem like anything was unusual. But on the ride home, their night takes a sudden turn for the worse. We got into the ride chair and we were on our way back to the hotel. Tyler and Sean had both fallen asleep, which I knew as soon as Tyler fell asleep that it wasn't, that was gonna be an issue for me because he is just a bear to wake up sometimes. When we tried to help him out of the car, he got mad, like he was frustrated and he just starts walking, like walking away and we are standing right in front of the door to our hotel. So I start to follow him, and Sean's like, no, Brittany, I got it. He's like, I'll go get him, we'll be right back. Sean had walked back, and I was like, you know, like, what's going on, where's Tyler? And he was like, oh, well, he's just, just taking a walk, Brittany, it's no big deal. And then I started to freak out, because now he was by himself. I was back to back calling him, and he wouldn't answer. And then when he did call me back, the last time I talked to him, he had said, I'm really sorry, like I see the hotel, I'm walking through the woods, I'll be there in five minutes. When we got off the phone, he immediately called me back and when I had answered, it was like an open line for four seconds and then it was cut. I tried to call him back and it went straight to voicemail and it has ever since. I was terrified, I, I didn't know what to do. I had called the Columbus Police Department. I was like, I need to file a missing persons report. I was just hoping it was gonna be just some really bad story for my birthday that we could laugh about, you know? But it's not. My name is Detective Jason Bramer. I work with the Columbus Police Missing Persons Unit, and I've been working the Tyler Davis case since he went missing. Tyler's case is what we call a red flag case. And the reason that we call it a red flag case is because things aren't normal. It could be life or death that we're dealing with. Within hours of Tyler's disappearance, detectives get to work retracing his steps. I decided that I wanted to personally start walking through a lot of the cellular data that we've been able to recover. I wanted to do a, a, a look at and evaluate all of the video evidence that we have. We can see on, on security footage that uh, Tyler walks off south away from the area once, once they get dropped off at the hotel. And, you know, we see his friend, Sean, follow after him. Police question Sean about his interaction with Tyler, but no leads come of it. Watching the security video of Tyler, you, you can tell that he's agitated. The body language itself just screamed frustration. When Tyler leaves the hotel, it's still a highly developed area over there with apartments, a lot of different businesses. 
when he does leave, he goes south away from the area and he, he gets onto his phone and, and, and asks for directions on how to get back to the hotel. Take me to the Hilton, room 403, Columbus, Ohio. Let's go. He's on his phone and you can hear his voice on two separate occasions. Then when he starts to walk east now, still directly away from the hotel, how do I get back to the hotel? Take me to Eastern Suites. I could hear the frustration and, and I'm hearing him, you know, trying to get back to where he needs to be, but he can't. I was able to map out his footsteps within a minute of each move that he made. He continued his way southbound until he made it to Eastern Commons, where he took a left-hand turn to go eastbound. Walking through at 3.42 at night, in the middle of the night, empty parking lots, trying to find his way around. He didn't know where he was. I'm seeing him cross streets, through trees, in private property areas around Easton, and at one point, his phone stops. His last steps that we have on there, are, you know, are, are putting him at a certain position to where after that, we don't know. It's here Tyler's trail goes cold. We know at some point that, that Tyler says, you know, I'm coming out of the woods. You know, I can see the hotel. Did he really, did he see the hotel? Was he confused about where he was? I went to every wooded area around all of Easton to see if I could see the hotel. It's really intimidating to stand there and just look because there's so many options, so many directions. There is a thick wooded area and also swamp and a few ponds over in the area. I've gone up in a helicopter multiple times along with our helicopter group to maybe try to blow vegetation out of the area and search if they can find something, any sign or evidence of Tyler. We've brought dive teams out, and they've searched the area. Sonar was brought over. We've had three different uh, searches over in the area using cadaver dogs. We were screaming his name for hours. It was dark. It was, it was cold. You can physically only do so much. We had a hit on, on one of our ponds by, by one of the cadaver dogs. You see a map of it here, and it doesn't look like a huge area until you get down there and you're on foot and you're walking through this in waist deep water and you understand yourself how bad it actually is. That's when it comes down to me putting on you know some waders and getting into the water myself and doing as much as I can to maybe bring this to a finish. But we've searched it and it came up with nothing. Despite fruitless efforts, Brittany hasn't given up hope. I'm never gonna stop trying to find him. There is an answer, we just have to figure out what it is. For all we know, Tyler could come back. We could have an answer. But the question still remains, where is Tyler Davis? When you're dealing with a case where you have no idea where the person went, of course your mind's gonna wander. Is this gonna be a case of he wanted to go live a new life somewhere? You're worried about, did he get hit by a car? Are we gonna find him in a ditch somewhere over in the area? There are a thousand different things that could have happened. Anything's possible. Looking into the, the, the possibility of maybe getting struck by a motorist, and we've, we've, we've found no evidence uh, as far as, you know, broken glass in the area, maybe from a headlight, but we still don't know for sure. We also have to wonder, did he wander off and, and decide to go leave a life of his own? Tyler wouldn't just leave. His son or his mom, if he didn't want to be in a certain situation, He's very open. Like, we have really good communication. There is no reason that Ty would want to leave that. He's not going to leave his baby boy, and he's not going to leave his wife. I can tell he voice activated his phone looking for directions on how to get back to the hotel. Easton Suites. Play it again here so you can hear it, but what he's saying at this point is he's saying, take me to Easton Suites. I knew his intent. I knew Tyler wanted to get home. Today, Tyler's loved ones continue to spread the word. Social media and the internet is so good for situations like this because Tyler's face and his picture has reached like hundreds of thousands of people. This is a case that has garnered a lot of public attention. There's hundreds of people on Facebook pages that are out there having their own little investigations about you know, what's been done and uh, where could he be or, or who could have did something nefarious to Tyler. I want Tyler's name to be in everybody's minds. He also has a young boy, and we want to be able to give him answers when he grows up. I want to be able to look at our son one day and be like, you know, I, I did everything that I could because Tyler would, he would do everything he could for me. 
I just I gotta continue to be strong for my family regardless what that entails. Coming up, young mother Crystal Reisinger mysteriously vanishes in the Rocky Mountains. She hasn't had any contact with us. There's been no trace of Crystal at all. Did she fall victim to the cruel terrain, or could there be a killer in the mountains? My name's Elijah Ghana. I've been searching for Crystal Ann Reisinger, the mother of our daughter. We're going on about three years now. After a tumultuous upbringing in Arizona, 29-year-old Crystal Reisinger builds a new life for herself in Denver, Colorado. Her childhood is really rough. She didn't really have a family. And the story she's told me, it's just amazing how a, a person could survive a lot of the things they do in childhood under such extreme circumstances and grow up with pretty much no guidance and, uh, and, and still be a good person deep inside. In October 2011, Crystal finally finds happiness. The moment I saw Crystal, she was exactly what I had been looking for pretty much <laughs> my whole life. <laughs> uh, she was gorgeous, beautiful, looked very different. And uh, as soon as we met, it was an immediate chemistry. She had a, a very intelligent, funny, witty uh, character to go along with her unique look. She was very compassionate very sensitive. She had a very contagious laugh. When she was laughing, you were laughing, and everyone around was having a good time. She was a very, just one of a kind person. Um, definitely not another girl like her. Almost two years into their relationship, Crystal gives birth to their daughter, Akasha Reisinger. <laughs> she really wanted a baby, <laughs> and uh, she just really uh, embraced the pregnancy. She would uh, always be singing and talking to her daughter in the womb and um, just, you know, already preparing. Her nesting instinct was really strong. But after she gave birth, that was it. Her whole life was our daughter. She was a really good mother, really attentive. She was just great. But Denver isn't where Crystal wants to raise their family. More and more, Crystal was becoming unhappy in the city. She felt like being in the city was a very toxic place. She really wanted to get in touch with nature. Crystal has always been a spiritual person. Like, I think even from a very young age, she's always been looking and searching and, and really, like, that's always been a part of her character. It was a really hard decision for all of us. She decided to go to Crestone because Crestone was a spiritual hub. In the spring of 2014, Crystal moves. Elijah and Akasha stay back in Denver with plans to reunite their family in the near future. We have been talking about plans for a start in a business and finding some sort of economic independence out there. Crystal would always be in contact with us, always talking to Akasha every day. She missed her terribly. But in July 2016, Crystal becomes mysteriously quiet. A couple of days went by and, and no response. I started calling friends and family. None of them had heard from her. By the third day, I knew something was wrong. I went to call the sheriff's department to file a report. And they had told me that a missing person's report had already been filed on her. Who could have filed that report? My name is Sheriff Dan Warwick, I'm the sheriff with the Swatch County Sheriff's Office. We'd gotten a call from the landlord saying that she was missing. It was just at the timing of it where the rent had been due. At first, Crystal's disappearance doesn't raise any red flags. We didn't look at it so much as a missing person case, but more as just somebody who left. We had no grounds to go into her apartment, so it was more of, okay, we'll just put some calls out and see if anybody has seen her. 
Meanwhile, Crystal's family travels to Crestone. Their concern finally grabs law enforcement's attention. I had went up to Crestone to look for her. We questioned everyone in town. We covered the town in flyers. Then we were able to get entry into her apartment and start going through things. Inside, investigators find alarming clues. When we searched her apartment, for one thing, she had just bought groceries the day before. It didn't look out of place. There was clothing, food, cell phones, uh, computers, just everything. She would have had to have gone off with absolutely nothing, not even her phone, not even her shoes. It just doesn't make any sense. Where could Crystal have gone? Some think they might have spotted her on the outskirts of town. The local folk in Crestone, once a month on a full moon, they have what's called a drum circle. They all get around a bonfire and play drums. The last people to actually see Crystal physically, it's hard to say. It, it could have been somebody at the drum circle if she was, in fact, there. If so, that means she could have been walking through intense wilderness. When you're walking a trail, you can fall, sprain an ankle, run into predators. It's very mountainous, very rugged, unforgiving terrain, just endless, endless wilderness. We've had search and rescue teams go out on foot. We've had dog members come in. There's too much area to look, and this is dense wilderness, and it is so easy to not find something that is just a few feet away. There's been no trace of Crystal at all. And that's when she went missing. I strongly believe she was murdered by these guys. Rumors spread, but no arrests have been made. There's a, a lot of theories regarding Crystal's disappearance. A lot of those theories may have some merit, but a lot of them may not. There's a lot of speculation as to what occurred. And I don't try to dwell into the information unless it's factual. Without hard evidence, the search for Crystal continues. There's been conflicting stories as to how they disposed of her. One of the common popular stories is that they threw her down one of the mine shafts. There are a lot of mines up there. That's been a thing that has been said in this county for a number of years. Anyone comes up missing, check the mines. More than 60 mines have already been searched, but no new evidence has been found. People are just saying, well, just go search the mountain. Well, it's not a mountain. It's a very large mountain range. It's not an easy thing to do. Now, I know there's people out there that knows what happened to Crystal. They have some information that could help us bring her home, or at the very least, bring her murderers to justice. There's probably somebody out there that knows exactly what occurred, but they're afraid of retaliation. They need to come forward and let's get this case taken care of. We love her and we're never gonna stop to try to bring her killers to justice.